Our presenter today is John Pullinger, the UK National Statistician, who will be talking on statistics for public policy. But before handing over to John, let me cover a few administrative points. John's slide set for today's meeting can be downloaded from the Professional Statisticians Forum webpage at www.rss.org.uk forward slash PSF. Uh, and as John gives his presentation, he will mention the slide number of the slide that he is discussing for the benefit of those who are only joining the audio part of the meeting. For those of you who have initially only joined the audio part of the meeting and wish to join the web portion of the meeting, enabling you to view the slides online whilst listening to John, a link to access the web conferencing system can be found at the same web address as I mentioned previously, that is www.rss.org.uk forward slash PSF, standing for Professional Statisticians Forum. Uh, this meeting is being recorded so that we can post a webcast on the past events subpage of the PSF webpage, and that will be done within five to ten working days. So a brief, a brief comment then on the structure of the session. Uh, John will give his presentation, and then we will have an opportunity for questions and discussion. All participants are initially muted. And when we get to the Q&A discussion part of the meeting, you can unmute by dialing star six to make your contribution. But if you, when you do this, please wait to hear you have been unmuted before asking your question. And of course, after making your contribution, please again mute by dialing star six. For those using the web conferencing option, you can ask your question verbally over the phone line as just described, or alternatively, type your question using the Q&A interface at the top of the screen during or immediately after the presentation. And finally, we would be grateful if before leaving the meeting you use the poll tab, again that's at the top of the screen, to record your feedback on today's session. And that poll tab will be activated some five or ten minutes before the close of the meeting. So just to reiterate for those, because people are joining all of the time, for anyone who's just joined the call, the slides for today's meeting and indeed the webcast of the, t of the meeting can be downloaded from the PSF webpage, www.rss.org.uk forward slash PSF. Okay, so, so much for the administrative information. Let's now move on to the start of the meeting. I'm very pleased indeed to introduce today's presenter, John Pullinger. Uh, John was appointed as the UK National Statistician, Head of the Government Statistical Service and Chief Executive of the UK Statistics Authority in July 2014. Uh, John in fact started his career as an Assistant Statistician at the Department of Trade and Industry in the early 1980s and has progressed through a variety of roles of increasing responsibility in UK government statistics before taking on the role in 2004 as librarian of the House of Commons and additionally in 2008 took on the role of uh, Director General for Information Services uh, before moved, taking on his current role in 2014. John has also recently been very active in the Royal Statistical Society. He is a chartered statistician. Uh, he's chaired the RSS Get Stats campaign and then became president of the society in 2013, a post which he held until he took on his new role uh, in, the GS, uh, in government statistics. So it is with great pleasure that I hand over to John to give his presentation entitled Statistics for Public Policy. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, when we open our newspapers every day or click online on a news site, almost invariably there are numbers splattered all over the place. Um, and it's an obvious question, where do these numbers come from? 
And I entitled this presentation Professional Statisticians, obviously. But clearly that only applies to some of them. Uh, you look at most of the numbers that are spread all over our newspapers and you really struggle to believe where they could possibly have come from and certainly not from a professional statistician. Often from someone trying to make a point, someone who has an axe to grind, someone who has got a particular prejudice and they want to cloak it in respectability by putting a number against it. My job and the job of the, of the people I work with is to try and get some numbers that stand out from the crowd. And for those of you who can see slide one, the thing to do is to look for the little tick when you see numbers presented in the press or on the news, or if you isn't in that article, click on the link and follow the link. If it's got that tick against it, you can be confident of its quality, confident of its trustworthiness, and confident that the number actually has some value to society as a whole. And that was the point of my post, um, which became a statutory post in 2008, um, set up to be independent of government. Um, I'm actually formally appointed by the Queen, which is quite interesting. In the wall outside where I'm sitting today, there is the, the letter of appointment that, that I got from her. But the key thing there is that for statistics really to be trusted, people have to be confident that they've come from an independent source, and particularly aren't just the numbers the government wants people to know about. And that's a fairly challenging um, brief, given that the public policy space is inevitably very political. But I'm extremely fortunate. Um, I have a team of some 2,000 professional statisticians working in the Office for National Statistics, which is where I am, but also in dozens of government agencies um, across the United Kingdom. Um, and we, in turn, are working with thousands more colleagues who are economists, social researchers, operations researchers, scientists in various disciplines, um, digital specialists, technology specialists, and many, many more. It's an enormous team effort. But the key thing I want to get across to you today is that it's the role of the professional statistician that is critical in doing that. So I'll move now to slide two. This is a series of headlines from last week. We started the week on Monday with um, inflation figures. So we have chasm grows in housing costs around the nation. We had that week also just started to show inflation nudging up from zero. Um, the reduction in the oil price is still pulling things down, but various other commodities that we buy are going up. So where do those kinds of numbers come from? The inflation statistics team inside ONS is every year checking out the nation's shopping basket, looking at what it is we spend our money on and how much of that money is going to each product, and then continuously around the year getting thousands upon thousands of quotes from businesses and shops all over, the, all over the country and bringing it together in a very, very systematic way so that the numbers that come out on Monday of last week particularly um, can, have, can command the confidence of everybody when we're thinking about how inflation is affecting us in our daily lives. Wednesday we had jobs. And we have on here, what do we have on jobs? One million more women are clocking on for work. Falling public sector work points to weak final quarter growth. Here again, an enormous team effort of colleagues inside ONS and also in the Department for Work and Pensions, where we get data on the number of people um, claiming, claiming benefits. Inside ONS, a very, very large household survey is going out continuously asking people whether they've got a job, whether they're looking for a job, what their qualifications are, and a host of other um, pieces of information that enable us to put together a picture of the current labour market. Thursday, it was crime. So we have violent crime and murder saw by 25%. Here again, it's a task of balancing um, a very detailed survey of victims um, with, the police, uh, with, with the police data on crimes recorded by them in police stations up and down the country, trying to make sure that we are triangulating between those sources of bias that could mislead people, those bits of data that might be missing, how we can draw out insights from putting information together. So a recent area of topical interest, I mean, clearly violent crime and murder is always uh, of interest in the figures. But how you get a handle on cybercrime, for example, has been a particular methodological challenge recently. Friday, it was public sector debt and borrowing. Boost for Chancellor as borrowing falls by 11 billion, screen the headlines. Here we work very closely with our Treasury colleagues who are monitoring all the money going in and going out of the government 
how much the government owes, um, how much that is going up or down, um, and clearly that's a pretty key target for the government during this um, period as it's seeking to um, reduce the deficit and eradicate it by the end of, um, end of the, the Parliament. And that's very, very closely watched by not just the Chancellor, but by many, many other people, since it affects the amount of um, money that's going to go into the public sector and elsewhere, and also more generally our economic prospects. That's just one week in the life of the government's fiscal service and in the life of professional statisticians who work in government. So that is what I'm doing now, but here I want to paint a um, slightly broader picture of where statistics fit into society and how professional statisticians, whether or not they work in the government's fiscal service, can make a contribution to using statistics much more broadly for the public good and getting the voice of the statistician out there so it really has the impact, impact it could make. Now, at Christmas 2012, um, I had a few days off, as most of us do over Christmas, but for me it wasn't really as idle and relaxing a time as it might always be, because I knew that on the 1st of January 2013, I was going to take on the role of the President of the Royal Statistical Society. And it wasn't something I'd have really dreamed I would en end up in, and Trevor's given a little bit of my history in his um, very generous introduction. But suddenly it was there, and for those of you that know the Council Chamber of the RSS, there is a somewhat intimidating board with gold leaf writing on, naming all of the presidents of the RSS that had gone before me, and trying to think how on earth can I have a particular role that supports the wonderful society that we've created over so many years progress further. It has people like Gladstone on it, who was the president of the RSS whilst also being the Prime Minister. Churchill, who did it when he was leader of the opposition. Many, many eminent academics leading their own institutions or research establishments. How was I going to fit in this role with my job, and how could I possibly complain if it took up a lot of my time when some of these other people had done it when they had so much more onerous commitments than I did? So I sat down to think, so what should my theme be? And Valerie Isham had been um, in the role before. She had taken the theme of um, the diversity of statistics, how we are engaged in every walk of life, and we have a, such a wide variety of people, and how this is a strength um, of our profession, that we really are everywhere. But it's also potentially a weakness and a risk because we're not concentrated like some others are and we need to come together for support. So I thought my theme would take this idea a little stage further and build on it. And I chose the theme of statistics making an impact. Now, how can we think of impact? And at that time, my day job was librarian of the House of Commons. So, as a librarian, the first thing you inevitably do is you look at a book. Now we're going to go to slide three. So the best book to go to is for this, as a start point at least, the Oxford English Dictionary. We had several tomes on our shelves of various, various levels of antiquity. But the one I chose, um, I looked up the word statistics. Um, and in that particular volume, there, there are some differences depending where you look. Um, the word statistics came into the English language in 1787, um, and I was very interested by the description of the root of the word. So statistics comes from the Latin word status, the state, or the state of being. And this whole idea of impact is really hardwired into the word itself. Originally it's not so much about methodology, it's not about the um, techniques and practices and the kinds of things that we do in our day job. It's about its purpose and its impact. And so the, the, the word status um, moved forward um, over the, the generations from, from Roman times um, into the Italian word statista, which is someone who is skilled in statecraft. And finally the word statistic comes into German rather later on when it starts to mean the, the information that is collected, assembled and disseminated that helps you understand the state and condition of a nation. So our calling, all of us, has got this link into um, understanding society, understanding the world around us and bringing that to light. So my researches then took me a little bit, bit further and I started looking at so how was it used in, in early times. Now, of course, in antiquity, um, and certainly going into Roman times, there's a lot of links with things like the census. 
In the census didn't have an entirely good rap in places like the Bible, for example, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It doesn't really come out um, very well. But why would that be? I think that's because the person who was conducting the census was the censor, and the censor was one of the trusted councillors of the emperor. He was collecting the numbers in order to enable the emperor to control the people. The numbers gave the emperor power. They enabled the emperor to understand where people were living, how many people could be raised for the army, how many people could pay tax. And that is why people were gathering in Jerusalem that winter's day, so many, a uh, couple of thousand years ago. So the role of the censor, the statistician, was about helping the ruler control people. And as it comes into English, go to slide four, uh, the Doomsday Book is probably the most um, notable English example of a new emperor, a new conqueror coming into the country. How can he work out how to control his people? Let's have a statistical account of the land and who owns it, um, and therefore how much can we extract from it as the king? And so it continued for many, many years, and the German word statistic captures this quite well, and the way it was used in German society in the 18th century was with this purpose. There were statisticians, most of them working very much in the pay of the, the emperor, um, or possibly the church, and I don't think there would necessarily be a difference in terms of the uh, um, relationship between church and subject and state and subject, although maybe we could discuss that another time. Um, but it was all about statistics. In The impact of statistics came through the impact of the ruler. Now, statistics came into the English language um, on or about... 1787, um, according to my researches, um, through the good offices of, of one, one chap, and the chap's called John Sinclair, who's a Scotsman, who had been travelling around Germany uh, and come back to Scotland, um, declaring that he had discovered this new word, statistic, in German, and thought we could have it in English as well. But he could see that this word would necessarily be about um, controlling the people. What he declared statistics could be be about improving the quantum of happiness of the people. So he had picked up on the Enlightenment concept that the people really should be the ones who are determining their own destiny, linking with the American fight for independence, linking with um, the French Revolution, linking with all kinds of things that were going on there about how society should be, and what a modern society should look like. And statistics was very much associated with that. At that time also, you've got the kind of perfect um, connection between that kind of political thought and the methodological improvements that were going on um, through people like Ketelet in Belgium, um, really getting the science of statistics to be much more advanced. Now, John Sinclair went on to produce um, the uh, first abstract of statistics, I think, in the world, but um, maybe the Swedes will compete with us on that one, so I'll stick with in Britain, the first one in Britain. It was abstract of statistics for Scotland, and it's on slide five. So he designed this abstract to enable everybody, including landowners like him, to improve things, both for himself, I guess, um, but also for the people. But John Sinclair went on to be one of the founding members of the RSS. On, on my researches, he was the oldest of the founding members, um, but very much connected with this idea of statistics as an improving force, actually at the heart of the founding of the RSS. Um, and certainly as far as my own history with the RSS is concerned, um, I've spent a lot of my career in and out of different committees of the RSS, um, but one of the most rewarding was serving on the long-term strategy group that went back to the original articles of the society and looked at how true we were still being to them. And we were pretty true to it. And it was all about this um, statistics in the service of the common good. Now, my favourite hero of um, that era is Florence Nightingale, the first female member of the society, and um, the work that she did first in the Crimea, but later coming back with one of my predecessors, William Farr, to try and understand um, statistics um, of, of medicine and statistics of hospitals and statistics of mortality, um, very much laying the foundations um, not just for what's now the NHS and health improvement, but also thinking about questions of sanitation and thinking about the way um, we organise ourselves and to really make sure that the decisions we make are based on what the evidence is telling us rather than our prejudices. And what I like most about her story is as a woman and as a nurse, she had a very weak voice 
um, in the hierarchy she was occupying, the military hierarchy of the Crimea, and was very unlikely to be listened to, particularly given the prejudice was if you want to win a war, you need more soldiers, you need more guns. Um, whereas her argument, based on the data, was it wasn't the soldiers and the guns of the enemy that were killing, um, killing our troops. It was the sanitation in the hospitals. And her wonderfully elegant um, uh, visualisations bring that to light with such power that you could not do anything but take notice. And that's a lovely driver for me and certainly for, for, for new colleagues coming into, into my team now. Um, but it's not just in, in public service. I think that uh, this kind of idea uh, and power of data really flourished um, from the Victorian period onward. I think in businesses particularly, and especially in the second half of the, the 20th century, the quality movement and the way in which statistics has become so embedded in understanding risk in finance or understanding clinical trials in the um, pharmaceutical um, arena. We have a professional place that makes whichever organisation we are in better. And I think one thing sometimes we do not do well enough, and certainly I think I pay tribute to the Professional Statisticians Forum for, for this, we do not do well enough is in sharing uh, the passion we have for what we do and giving ourselves then the courage to go and share it inside our own organisations. We have a lot to share with people and a lot that if only they could understand what the numbers were saying, they would make better decisions. So I now move to slide six. Because about 25 years ago, in my view, everything changed. And the everything that changed was the internet. All of our thinking about numbers and statistics was, in my argument, um, thinking that was based on a situation where there was a scarcity of numbers um, and also a scarcity of demand for numbers. The uh, original Enlightenment um, concept was very much around a kind of meritocratic view of the world where there were certain um, benign people, they may have got themselves elected, but they came from a very particular class who were calling the shots, who were making the decisions. And there were an elite group of professionals who were able to gather the evidence to enable them to make those choices um, um, well. Now the internet, I think, it's taken a while growing, but I think it is changing everything. Because we've gone from a scarcity of supply and a scarcity of demand to a superfluity of both. Everyone is an armchair statistician. Everywhere there is data. So what does that mean for us as statisticians and how should we respond to it? And that was my thinking as I came into this role of President of the RSS. And that's what I sought to explore as I went around sections and local groups, um, went to myriads of meetings and talked to all sorts of people, um, including giving my, my President's address in, uh, in 2013. So that was my preparation for this job getting in a lot of insights from the unique perspective you have as the President of the RSS, thinking that statistics has its impact through its unique connection with power. In antiquity, that connection with power was very much manifested by being the confidant of the emperor. In the post-enlightenment period, um, that power was exercised by bringing insights that enabled the quantum of happiness of the people to be improved. In the internet era, we're still working out what it means. So on the 1st of July 2014, I started my current job, and I applied exactly the same logic to that one as I did when I joined uh, or, or took up the role of President of the RSS. And now moving to slide 7. And as it happened, and very happily, it was 75 years today that the man in the slide, instantly recognisable to everybody, Winston Churchill, created my post. So on 27th of January 1941, when he did actually have a few other things on his mind, um, he had concluded that the utmost confusion is caused when people argue on different numbers. I need someone who can bring together the evidence so it can be accepted and used without question. He was being bombarded by different people, different groups, who had their own set of figures purporting to justify um, their particular claims on his time or his resources their particular ideas about how the war should be conducted. So the essence of the role of the statistician who supports public policy 
is to create those numbers that will be accepted and used without question. So I think my task, which I hope maybe we'll pick up in questions afterwards, is how do we reinterpret that task for the current age? Moving to slide eight. Because I fear the utmost confusion is still out there. I spend a lot of my time um, working with politicians. I mean, here we have the House of Commons chamber. Um, politicians inevitably and quite rightly come from all different walks of life with all different viewpoints. Um, but if they are to make wise choices, they need to understand what's going on and they need to trust the voices that are telling them um, what particular claim can be justified and what cannot. So my first insight is that our critical role is to help Britain make better decisions, help politicians make better decisions, help businesses make better decisions, help individuals make better decisions. So whether we have the internet age or not, if we're to reinterpret our role for the modern age, we need to understand what are the decisions that matter in today's society. So preoccupying me at the moment and many of my colleagues is how do we understand a modern economy? We have what's known as a productivity puzzle, where British productivity appears to lag quite significantly behind many of our competitors. What's going on? What is happening? Um, how do we understand um, traditional forms of economic value compared with new forms from the digital economy, the sharing economy, various other forms of, uh, of transactions, where money doesn't necessarily change hands anymore. Airbnb would be a good example, but we are undoubtedly getting great value from the fact that those services exist. I certainly feel myself, after many years of promise, um, the data revolution is finally helping me in my daily life. I certainly don't need a map when I go anywhere. I don't need to spend time with a travel agent if I want to book a holiday. I'm actually improving the value that I'm getting out of my life and actually spending less money doing it. What's not to like about that? But how do you capture that in a set of statistics that helps politicians decide when to worry and when not to? And at the same time as that, the need to engage with the decision makers, we also need to engage with the media and engage with the public. So this is item nine. Sometimes it's a little bit um, scary for the statistician to feel they will have a microphone um, shoved in their face. Uh, and that's another thing you learn as president of the RSS. People want your views and you are kind of out there on the record. And I think we must learn not to be shy of that. We must learn the tricks of the trade. Indeed, one of the best training courses I, I think I ever did was a media training course and I would commend it to anybody. It doesn't just work with the media, it works with any interaction where you need to be influential with someone um, and potentially where you feel you've got a tricky message to convey. Um, I wouldn't necessarily commend the one that I did because uh, the person who organised it for me probably had a slightly wicked, um, wicked streak because it was two um, ex-army um, chaps who, well first of all they, they did put a video camera in your face but the whole method was to kind of break you down before they build you up. Um, but it did me a lot of good. It certainly helped me not to fear the fact the media are there and not to be surprised when you're misinterpreted either, but also to realise it's an immensely powerful and important medium for the professional statistician to get our message across. And if you embrace it, certainly my experience of most journalists is if, they, if, if you embrace it and they trust you, um, they will report your story reasonably straight. Of course, they've got their own axe to grind, their own living, living to earn, and you can't guarantee it. Um, but we shouldn't be frightened of it. It is an opportunity for us to make an impact, to make a difference, to bring our professionalism to a wider audience. But also in that public domain, it's absolutely essential that we do. I think we all really do have a public mission to explain. We do have a mission, certainly I feel I have a mission to avoid confusion. Um, and if we don't go out there debunking the myths, no one else will. Um, society needs to know what's really going on if it's not to be misdirected. And there's so many people who want to misdirect, who've got a particular viewpoint, who want to try and take you down a path, and often try and use numbers to do it. We need to stand up against that. So now going on to slide 10. I was very lucky in my year as president that it coincided, uh, my first year as president, it coincided with the International Year of Statistics. Because what that did, I think, was make a community across the whole world realise that standing together, we really can stand up for professional integrity and we can have a collective voice. 
um, and show that professional practice in statistics is just as important as professional practice in medicine or law or accounting or any of those others, where people wouldn't dream of um, building a bridge without a chartered engineer being present or conducting an operation without someone being a medically qualified doctor. So why on earth would someone trust a claim made by someone who wasn't a professionally qualified statistician? Um, the International Year of Statistics helped us get that message across, and there were thousands and thousands of organisations signed up to it, big and small, in all parts of the world. And certainly I drew a lot of strength, strength from that, and um, the JSM meeting that year um, in, in, uh, in, in Boston was a great chance to, to kind of celebrate with so many, many thousands of colleagues from around the, around the world. Um, but as well as celebrating the good stuff, I think it also emboldens us to tackle the bad stuff and to challenge the use of numbers when they're not good enough. Use our sceptical street to say, can that possibly be right? If we think it, po it couldn't possibly be right, don't just put the newspaper down and grumble. Write a letter, send an email, make your point, write, do something. Um, I think it's an affront to our profession if we allow, allow those kind of claims to go unchallenged. Indeed, when I worked in the House of Commons, my office was right next to the House of Commons chamber, and there was one MP in particular, and sadly he lost his seat at, at, um, uh, at the election before last. But he used to stump into my office um, and say, are you listening to what they're saying in there? It's all rubbish. They don't understand the numbers. What are you doing about it? Now, maybe I was a little bit, little bit foolish, but I did take that to heart. I did think, well, what am I doing about it? I should be doing something about it. I'm the professional around here. Let's stand up when things are not good enough. So I'm now coming to my kind of final um, kind of segment of this and going to slide 11. Because on the back of the International uh, Year of Statistics um, and coming into to my new role, I had what really has been a unique opportunity uh, that last year I was elected as the chair of the United Nations Statistical Commission, um, which is a wonderful thing to do, and um, I'm extremely humbled by having had that opportunity. Um, but last year was an amazing year to be in that seat. Um, uh, for those who have, have the, the chart, the, the people sitting next to me on my right is Stefan Schweinfest, who is the director of statistics for the United Nations, the United Nations Statistical Department, so he's effectively me for the United Nations. But on my left is a lovely lady called Juliette, um, who is our secretary, and she is the secretary of other um, United Nations commissions as well, um, but the main other one that she services is the Commission on Nuclear Disarmament, um, and I think she found the atmosphere in a room full of statisticians rather different to the atmosphere she finds when she's dealing with nuclear disarmament. But the thing that's most disarming about her was how she said, but you're all such lovely people. Um, and we really ought to celebrate the fact that the statistical profession is a profession populated by, by lovely people. And that carries us a long way. But it needed to carry us a long way in this UN meeting. Formerly, the United Nations Statistical Commission is 24 countries who are elected for four-year terms. Um, and those terms come up and, and rotate. So the UK is one of those 24 at the moment. But in practice, very many large, or very, very large numbers of people turn up to these meetings. So on slide 12, it's looking the other way. And it's the three of us looking out on this sea of people. Um, and actually that day there were 500 people present, not just the ones you could see, even in the distance, but also in the background there were a couple of side rooms. Everybody wanted to turn up to this meeting. Um, as chair, uh, you can see I've got a screen in front of me, and that tells me which country to call. But my eyesight isn't bad, but I couldn't even see half the people I was, I was calling, and that really was extraordinary. This was a massive, massive thing. But why was it a massive thing? It's a massive thing because the United Nations General Assembly um, had decided on a set of goals and targets to try and ensure that no one in the world was left behind in global progress by 2030. And they really meant it. They are looking to understand what is happening in every economy, every society, every part of the environment, every aspect of peace and security and governance in the world, to try and tackle those things that are not as they should be and put them right. And that's an extraordinary ambition. Uh, but the role of the United Nations Statistical Commission 
which we were formally given by the General Assembly, is, OK, you statisticians, work out how we'll measure it. How will we know when we've succeeded? Now, first of all, it's um, quite a tribute to us that we were given that role, um, and uh, I don't think it's ever been quite so precisely put. But in giving it to us, they very specifically told us we should do it in accordance with what's known as the United Nations Fundamental Principles of Official Statistics. And you'll see that very closely echoed in the UK Code of Practice for Official Statistics and in um, the Code of Practice for Professional Statisticians in the RSS. They wanted to make sure that it was a professional statistical job that was done with this, so that they would not be able to wriggle off the hook of their own commitments. So since that meeting, um, I've spent quite a lot of time briefing the UN General Assembly, in fact I've got another briefing with them tomorrow, explaining how we are getting on in coming up with a set of indicators that will measure all the goals and targets that politicians from around the world have agreed to. And they agreed to those commitments at the United Nations General Assembly last September. And I had the opportunity to go, go, go there. There were heads of state from many countries, including David Cameron from the UK. Um, President Obama was there. President Putin was there. Pretty much all the heads of state you could think of. And if there's anyone listening who was in New York um, that weekend, they'll know it wasn't a good day to try and get anywhere. The whole city was in lockdown. There were more hummers per square inch than um, I think anyone had ever seen before, although there are no reliable professional statistics on that, as far as I know. But we have now got an historic global task as a professional community. How do we mobilise all of the world's data or create the new data that it needs to chart progress across the world, in every region, in every country, in every community, to understand exactly what are the drivers of economic progress, what are the issues around social inequalities and social exclusion, what is actually happening to our environment, what are the pros and cons of climate change, what are the things that need to be surfaced if the world is to ensure that no one is left behind, what are the measures of peace and security and good governance that will help us really understand which kind of um, forms of society um, are likely to fail and plunge their citizens into despair? How do we make it much less likely that what's happening in Syria and other parts of the world happens again? So it's not our responsibility to fix all that. It is our responsibility to work out how we can measure it in a way that will not be contested, that will be accepted and used without question by politicians. The critical task for us is to think, what have we each got that will help us with that task? Whether you're working in official statistics or not, think hard about the data that could be available to us. Think what you can do to join us. Come and come, we have plenty of jobs going here, despite the fact there, is a, a, there are cutbacks. Come and work with us. But you don't need to work with us to ask the questions send in an email to come up with an idea, to work with whoever the authorities are in your own country, work within your own organisation to think what data we got that could be put to good use in this historic endeavour. I've had a meeting just before this lecture with um, a, a team that's been created by Harvard and MIT in, in the US, specifically looking at the moment at um, the data that's held by mobile phone companies. There are all kinds of issues, ethical issues, um, um, intellectual property issues, customer relations issues with the data, but it's undoubtedly the most extraordinary data set, one of the most extraordinary data sets in its richness and in many countries in its reach. And a project I've looked at, which may kind of give you an idea of the sorts of things in my mind, um, Orange, the, the phone company, is very active in Francophone countries in particular, um, has worked very closely with the census office in Senegal and Côte d'Ivoire to think how can the data we hold about mobile phones help the National Statistical Organisation get the data you would normally get in a census, which is terribly difficult in countries like that, where some, some parts of the country are very remote, where there are issues of skills and organisation that make it hard to do the kind of um, significant operational task that censuses involve in many, many other countries. What is it we can bring to the table? For the UN General Assembly, we have come up with 229 different indicators. Most of those indicators then get broken down by a whole series of disaggregations between women and men, between gender, between age, between different kinds of, of disadvantage. The quantity of data needed to help politicians around the world make better decisions on these questions 
is absolutely extraordinary. The statistical skills needed to synthesize that data so that it can be um, turned into some kind of insight, some kind of analytical tool that actually draws out what the data tells us, require profound methodological development and methodological work that will might mean statisticians working in universities, businesses, governments, uh, and other organizations coming together and getting creative. Having done all that work, the tools that we need to present it, to visualize it, to turn it into a form that is actually capable of consumption by politicians, um, by community groups, um, by individuals, is going to require a kind of profound way of turning what is an inherently impossibly complex set of information into something that people can understand, comprehend, and act on. All of us have a part to play in that. My presentation has been entitled Statistics for the Public Good. Many of you will be working directly on that role in a government context. Many of you will be working in your own sense, perhaps directly in that role in a business or in a university. All of us are always working in that role because the whole point of being a statistician is to make an, inset, make an impact, to make sure that the insights that numbers can bring are brought out and are brought to the people who would benefit for me, it's a great joy being a professional statistician. I'm sure it is for you too. As a community of statisticians together, we have an enormous strength. But in this age of the data revolution, in this new age that the internet has brought on, we have a potential to have a greater influence and a greater impact, I would argue, than ever before. That's the end of my presentation. I'm very happy now to take questions, but I'll hand back to Trevor first to organise proceedings. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Uh, a very thought-provoking presentation. Much appreciated. Um, John, you were, you were making the point about statistics making an impact, uh, I guess, through the work of professional statisticians. Um, clearly, looking back over your career, you've had quite a varied role since uh, you started as an, uh, an assistant statistician in the GSS. If you were to give advice to somebody at that early stage of their career now, what would your top tips be on the skills and knowledge and experience they should try and gather together to make a, an impactful career uh, in official statistics? Uh, I've, I've got a very simple um, proposition and a slightly harder one to, to fulfill. My simple proposition, which I really very strongly believe, is Spend a bit of time working on the other side of the street. Um, spend time with the people who are your consumers, whoever they are. Understand their world. Because unless you understand their world, it's very difficult to work out both what they need and how they are able to consume it. Um, and that was, for me, a great class of working in the House of Commons for, for 10 years. That uh, MPs are incredibly demanding consumers of information. Um, but unless you put it to them in a way they can easily consume, they just won't. They're in too much of a rush. So thinking about how you, how you really understand what it is that's going to, going to help them. So my first tip, and I do give this tip to, to new recruits, is find an opportunity to spend time, um, even just a day, with the people who are, are using your figures. In a government context, go to the minister's office, go to the press office, go to the policy team, go to the people who are actually working on the front line at the border or in a benefits office and see what it's like for them, so that you can then tailor your product to something they can use. That's my first tip. Um, my second tip, which is a bit harder to operationalise, and it's not always done me any favours, is say yes. If someone gives you a new challenge, don't say, oh, I'm a bit busy at the moment, um, just say yes, um, because one of the hardest things we have to do as a statistician is actually get through the door. Um, and if we're a bit reluctant, people will stop asking very, very quickly. Um, now it's, it is a bit of a challenge, and as I say, sometimes it's um, made my life very difficult, or particularly my wife's life very difficult. Um, but uh, certainly for me, making sure you do take up a challenge and don't be frightened of it. Most challenges are frightening, but the great thing about statistics is we've got plenty of friends who can help us. So once we've said yes, let's ring up our mates and really make a go of it. Okay, so I have a question from Brian Gazella which says, I remember the late Sir John Borum at my assistant statistician's induction course in 1979 advising all the young aspiring government statisticians to always remember that their most important product is the written word explaining the numbers, not just the numbers. 
Has anything changed since then? Uh, yes, is my answer. What's changed since then is pictures um, and moving images even. So um, the theme that John was putting out there is, is about communication and you need to think about the most effective communications medium for your audience. Um, and I think he was, he was saying, I think he did something um, rather similar at my induction course um, around about the same time, which is that um, the numbers need to be put in the, in the form that will able, able, they will be consumed by the users. Now then it was mainly um, words. Words are still important. Uh, I guess the simplest point is that um, a word speaks for a thousand numbers, a picture speaks for a thousand words, and a video speaks for a thousand pictures, but maybe that's so we've got a billion-fold amplification by using a, a moving image. Use the medium which your audience will most likely internalise. Um, that was John's message. It, I think that endures as well today for all of us. That's my answer to that one. But what's changed is the fact we've got many more means to communicate, and I think visualisation is a, is a fabulous opportunity, particularly dynamic visualisation. You can really capture people's imagination with that. Um, this is from Giles Foster. Uh, do you think that the public are becoming more cynical in either believing data or allowing their data to be used for the public good? Um, are people becoming more cynical? Uh, well, there's no stats on the matter, as far as I know, which makes me hesitant to, to <laughs> leave in here. I, I mean, I, I think people have always been a bit cynical about that. I mean, some countries more than, more than others, but certainly in the, in the UK context, there's been that healthy cynicism. We always think it's getting worse, but pick up some newspapers from 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and they're just as vitriolic and kind of snidey as you see, see here now. So I would be very hesitant to say things are getting worse. I think, though, on the question of um, uh, the, the kind of use of data, I think there is a, a very important moment for us uh, now, and it could go either way. Uh, and maybe the two parts link to each other. I think people are worried that their data is going to be used inappropriately. Uh, the, the issue with care dot data in the NHS recently is one public sector example. The mess that TalkTalk Talk got into when there was a loss of data, that feeds into a, a general unease that people feel. Um, and it's because the data revolution is, is revolutionary, people are uneasy about it. So when they see something bad, it resonates very strongly in their, in their, in their kind of consciousness. So I think we need to be anxious about that and we need to do whatever we can in our own, in our own realms to well, make sure the data we, that held about individuals or individual businesses is kept securely and is protected, but also to think about the ethics of it. Is, is what we're doing right? Um, and the one bit of machinery I've set up in this job is a data ethics advisory committee that happens to be meeting as we're speaking about um, 10 metres away from this, this room. Um, and I need good advice and good counsel about what it is right to do with to do with the numbers, because if we get that wrong, we will lose public trust, and then all bets are off in terms of the good things that we can do. Um, so in that one, I think we need particularly to be careful at the moment. But one way we can ensure ourselves is to deal with the first part of, of Giles's question, which is to be much better at describing um, the public good that we are creating um, and making sure the data we're putting out is believable. Um, so I don't think people are believing it more or less than they did before, but if we can really make sure that what we're doing as professional statisticians stands out, then we're much more likely to mitigate the risk that the public will feel that um, use of their data is somehow inappropriate. Thanks very much, John. Shall I read uh, another question, and this is from Alistair McAlpine. Um, you talked about our relationship with the press. What are the key messages you try to get across to the press when you speak to them, or your common themes? Um, I think the, the main thing from the, the press is, is, is to appear straightforward and honest. I mean, they're used to dealing with people who are representing an interest, so whether it be a business interest or a political interest. So they're always on the lookout for whether someone's trying to sell them a line. Now, what they really respect about us when we go there is we're not trying to sell them a line. 
you know, this morning we've had the release of um, economic activity for, for the whole of, of last year for the first time. We're one of the first countries in the world to, uh, or the fastest in the world to put that number out. But one of my directors, Joe Grice, has been on TV today. And things that he says to them are accepted and used without question because he comes across as being absolutely straightforward. He's just telling people, this is what the numbers show. Um, and then if you do that in a simple language, the press will just take it. So I guess the simple thing, don't be shifty. Just, just be yourself and show that you're a professional and you're much less likely to be tripped up. Um, certainly when I've been on some interviews where I've been up against a politician, for example, um, and the interviewer, I had one famous occasion on the Today program, the interviewer talked to the politician to start with um, and was saying about how terrible our numbers were. Um, and my response was, well, that's why I've been talking to you and your office for the last several weeks about how we put them right. And complete collapse of stout party, I immediately admitted we hadn't got it all right. We were trying to fix it. Um, and just be honest. Um, and uh, it carries you a long way. But I said simplicity, and I rambled on for ages. <laughs> simplicity is probably... <laughs> simplicity and honesty. Okay. John, could I, could I change the topic a little bit and, and come back to the International Year of Statistics? You, in your presentation, you mentioned, in a sense, a short-term impact that you know, people got together, collaborated, and there was a sort of a, a strong voice coming from statisticians. Do, do you have any sense that that has continued? Or, or were there any metrics set up as part of that initiative to measure the continuing impact of that uh, initiative? And what we tried to do, and it was the ASA, American Statistical Association, that were really leading it, was to create a, a partnership of, of the various bodies that signed up for um, international year statistics and then kind of sustain that as a, as a network. Um, I'm not absolutely sure how far that's got, I, I just don't know, but the idea was to say so the metrics were let's get as many different organisations from as many different sectors involved, metric one, metric two, and let's keep them involved and, and, try, and try and grow it. Um, now, I, I'm not sure whether that, that, that's happened, but what I do feel has happened myself, and it's, it connects with my presentation about the UN, is uh, I feel it, it really has given us a, a further impetus to the global community of statisticians. Um, so within the RSS, for example, I think there's a lot more emphasis on the international strategy, I mean, not just about membership, and really um, international members from beyond the UK are, are always very, very welcome into the RSS, and about 20% of our members are, um, but also thinking about what the RSS can do to support development, um, and we've now got a much more active um, group looking at development, and I think the International Year of Statistics was a good catalyst and um, kind of push for us to do that. So in that sense, I think it really has been sustained. Shall I read this one out? If you wish. Come on, Sue. I said we wanted simplicity here. This is going to take me a while. Um, for GSS colleagues not in the ONS, it can feel difficult to communicate with the press or media. Colleagues from comms sometimes make the point that they are the comms professionals, and it's not for us statisticians to try to be proactive. The implication being that we should stick to our scheduled releases and purely factual responses to queries. Is this something that we can do anything about? Is this something a national statistician could raise with government heads of comms, for example? Um, yes, I think is the short answer. Um, comms in government is, a, is quite a challenging space, and I think sometimes we need to think quite hard about how we build the relationships. What I'm seeing is that in some departments there has been an extremely creative and productive relationship between professional statisticians and the comms teams. Um, I'd think about TWP as a good example of this. Um, and that is mainly because ministers recognised it was actually important to them to have a separate and trustworthy voice coming from the statisticians. And they've been able to develop that and the, 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 the senior um, members of the GSS team there have done a great job. Um, but from a comms point of view, you're going to be wanting to trust the message um, and trust how it's done. So. It's a, it's a bit of a two-way street. From our point of view, and certainly from my point of view, I would always advocate for statisticians to have a separate voice. Um, I mean, it's already the duty of every head of profession in the government department to take responsibility for the form, content, and timing of any release. And when you're getting into a social media world, that's something that's 
slightly harder to, um, to assess. But the specific action that I'm taking, which I think is what you're looking for here, is that um, I've just recruited a new head of comms in ONS. It's very much going to be his role to be part of the government communication service community um, and to get out there and explain what the GSS is and why it's important for us to have a clear voice and why it's important for ministers for the statistical voice actually to be separated from the political voice. Otherwise, the, kind of, the, the facts tend to get kind of submerged. Now, we don't solve this overnight. It all works on relationships and trust. Um, and we shouldn't always claim that um, just because we've got something to say, we, 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 we have a, a higher right to say it than others. In the political space, ministers are responsible for their communications departments, and they're going to want to control those messages. We have to find that middle ground that enables everybody to understand what the distinctive voice of the professional statistician is. I think we're a lot better off than we were a few years ago. Um, I think the Statistics Act has helped. But I think the next stage is taking that communications element um, to a much richer level. But there's some good role model models to build on. Um, and Chris Lyons, when he starts, which is at the end, beginning of March, very soon now, is going to be raising that across the um, government communications network. So I hope that's a bit helpful. We can continue this conversation offline, if you like. Thanks for that answer, John. I think um, since we don't seem to have any additional questions, I'll start bringing the meeting to a close. I'd just like to thank John for um, giving a very thought-provoking presentation and very detailed responses to the questions that we've raised. Uh, much appreciated, John, for a, a very, very good presentation. So thank you very much.